Hey everybody, my name's Zach, and today I'm going to talk about how to run the Call of Cthulhu 7th edition scenario, Mist Dues. Mist Dues is a short scenario that can be run in a single session. It comes with the Call of Cthulhu 7th edition Keeper Screen Pack, and it's set in 1920s America in Lovecraft's infamous fictional town of Arkham, Massachusetts. The players play criminals from Arkham's underworld, brought into the office of local mob boss Mordecai the Hammer O'Leary. The Hammer tasks them with finding Sticky Jack, a local thief that recently angered the Hammer by pulling three robberies in one night on the Hammer's turf without paying him his cut. The players have one one week to find Jack or face the wrath of the hammer. This is a great one shot that can be a really fun way to introduce new players to the game system. It takes about three or four hours to run in a single session. So in this video, I'm going to lay out the story behind the mystery. I'm going to go over each section of the scenario and give you tips on how to run them. And then at the very end, I'm going to give you a one minute actionable plan for how to run this scenario successfully as a new keeper. So let's get started. All right, just a quick disclaimer before we get started. This video is for keepers only. I'm gonna be spoiling the whole story and talking about handouts, structure, pacing, and running encounters. So if you're a player, stop here. Call of Cthulhu is a mystery game, and if you spoil all the reveals for yourself, you won't have any fun. All right, keepers, now that it's just us, let's dive right in. This scenario is set in Arkham, Massachusetts in 1922. You could not pick a more quintessential Lovecraft setting. However, the characters in this particular story are different than your average Call of Cthulhu game. Whereas most scenarios are focused on scientists, professors, police detectives, journalists, slowly uncovering the horror of the mythos through library research and traveling to remote locations. This scenario revolves around the criminal underbelly of Arkham, and most of the 1920s gangster types portrayed are not particularly bright. I'll be honest, I'm really normally not that into 1920s Prohibition Gangsters as a setting. One, two, ten. And actually, for what it's worth, neither is Sandy Peterson, the creator of Call of Cthulhu. His video on why is a really great watch, and I highly recommend checking it out right here if you can. But despite my general disinterest in this setting, for this particular scenario, I actually found it to be really fitting and a fun change of pace. An experienced player that I ran this scenario for thought it, that it was really interesting and challenging to play a character who felt out of place in a university library. It also serves as a really great introduction for new players who might have those D&D &D instincts. <laughs> since the pre-generated investigators actually have pretty good fighting skills compared to the average Call of Cthulhu character. And on that note, I highly recommend running this scenario with the pre-generated investigators that are provided, especially if you're running it as a one-shot. The reason why is because all the pre-generated investigators have the criminal occupation and have skills weighted towards fighting and away from academics. Like I just mentioned, this inversion of typical investigator skills was a really fun and fresh way to play the game, and it helped deepen the immersion for this particular setting. Plus, each pre-generated investigator comes with a brief story hook at the beginning of the scenario and a fun criminal name like the Hat, Pug, or Lurch. My players had a lot of fun picking their characters just based on the names alone and then playing that up in their roleplay throughout the session. All right, let's get started by diving into the mystery. Here's what actually happened up until the investigators entered the picture. A local thief named Sticky Jack was hired to perform three robberies by Jacob Smith, a cultist of Azathoth who had recently moved to Arkham and started a local chapter of the cult under the guise of a strange Christian church. Smith wanted Jack to steal an ancient dagger, an ancient scroll, and some research notes on the scroll from the nearby Miskatonic University. Smith knew that the dagger and the scroll were artifacts of Azathoth, but he wasn't exactly sure what their purpose was. One week ago, Sticky Jack successfully stole all three items in one night and headed back to his apartment to lie low before delivering the items the next day. Looking over the artifacts, Jack absentmindedly read the words from the scroll translation aloud while tracing the strange geometric patterns on the paper with the dagger that he had stolen. His actions caused him to unwittingly cast a spell opening a portal to the court of Azathoth, the presence of which has since infested and corrupted the reality of the apartment building. Jack became the unwitting conduit for this portal, and the situation drove him completely insane in the process. Despite repeated suicide attempts, Jack has been unable to die and unable to leave his apartment. No one but the cult knows what really happened here. The player characters are brought in to find out what happened to Sticky Jack by Mordecai the Hammer O'Leary, a local crime boss who knows nothing of the situation, but was angered when he found out in the papers that Sticky Jack had made robberies on his turf without paying the dues back to the boss. The investigation is resolved when the players confront the now insane Sticky Jack in his apartment and either close the portal to Azathoth or die trying. Okay, so now that we've gone over the mystery and talked about the setting, 
let's jump into the three main sections of this scenario. The first section is the opening and the motivation. Play opens with the PCs being led down into the hammer's office. As written, the hammer gives a tie-in for how each pre-generated character screwed up and now owes him a favor. He then explains the situation with Sticky Jack and tells the characters that they can make up for their mistakes by finding out what happened to Sticky Jack and either getting the hammer's cut from him or retrieving the stolen merchandise. Finally, he throws them out on the street without giving them a chance to ask questions. The section does two things. Firstly, it establishes the mystery that needs to be solved. Where's Sticky Jack? This is done through the monologue that the hammer gives, but you could easily change the format if you're not into performative GMing or if you don't like speaking in character. Secondly, this section gives the player characters a motivation. This is extremely important for establishing the tension in any horror mystery story. The player characters must have a reason why they want to keep investigating once they start realizing that the mystery is dangerous and scary. Think of common horror movie tropes like being stranded without cell signal. Anyone getting a signal out here? Where's no one can get a signal up here. I can't get a signal. Oh, still no signal. There's no signal. Find a signal? No, nothing. Um, or alternatively, staying in a haunted house because the family can't afford to move again. To make most horror scenarios work, the PCs need to have a reasonable answer to the question, this is scary, why don't we just run away? In this scenario, the answer is the hammer. The module alludes to him using his signature claw hammer as a cruel weapon of retribution against those who cross him, and I strongly suggest playing this up in your own scenario. Scare the players into feeling fully committed to finding Sticky Jack, no matter how scary and dangerous the investigation gets. What I did was to have the hammer reading a newspaper at his desk as his goons escort the player characters into the room. I describe how the characters stand there in complete silence for a full minute while the hammer reads, and then finally folds up his paper and places it neatly on his desk, meeting the eyes of the characters. This is to establish the hammer's dominance and confidence in his relationship with the characters. He knows he can make them an offer they can't refuse. Then, about midway through the hammer's monologue, I described how another set of goons drag this distraught and groveling man who's begging the hammer for mercy into the room. The hammer ignores him and points to a door in the wall, and the goons drag the man crying and screaming through the door and shut it behind them. Shortly afterwards, the player characters hear the sickening sound of bones breaking from blunt impact, and the man screaming so loud his vocal cords begin to audibly fray before a final sudden crunch results in silence at which point the hammer continues his monologue. Adding this detail worked really well because it accomplished two things. Firstly, it set the dark and morally confronting tone that I wanted for the play session. And secondly, it answered that question raised above for the players. Why don't we just run away? Well, because the hammer and his goons will drag us into a basement and break our bones with hammers until we die. Nothing can be worse than that, right? Once the players have the mystery and the motivation established, it's time to move on to the main section of the scenario, which is the investigation. They get thrown back on the street by the Hammer's goons, and it's up to them to lean on their criminal contacts and resources around Arkham to uncover the three main clues they'll need to progress to the final section of the module. The three clues are as follows. Firstly, they need to find out that Sticky Jack stole an ancient Native American dagger, as well as an ancient Greek scroll and a set of notes about that scroll from Miskatonic University. Second, they'll need to find out that Jacob Smith from the Temple of Hope put him up to the job, and that the church's faith is unusual and they're likely up to something sinister. Third and finally, they'll need to learn that Sticky Jack went back to his apartment after the robberies at 22 Curzon Street to lay low, and he probably hasn't been seen since. The players uncover these clues doesn't really matter, but with one exception. Make sure that the players uncover clues number one and number two before discovering the address of Sticky Jack's apartment. Otherwise, they may get to the apartment without enough context to piece together the mystery, and the ending won't make any sense. Last time I ran this scenario, I kept my players from getting that information too early by creating a small chase scene between the PCs and Greasy Spoon. As long as you take care of that one thing, your job as keeper in this section is basically to say yes when the players come up with an idea about where to go, you have them make a few skill rolls in order to improv a fun little story about their attempt to get the info, and then as long as they don't fail spectacularly, just give them the clues. Depending on the type of players you have, I also suggest just openly spelling out what their options are. I did so by simply taking the Arkham, Massachusetts map and drawing an X and a label next to each location that their characters would reasonably know about. Remember, in a tabletop RPG, your players only know what you tell them. Unless your group loves player agency and you trust them to help you collaboratively create the setting as you're playing the game, then don't just do that thing where you put them out on the street with no leads to go on and you fold your arms and say, what do you do? No, instead, 
point out a few spots to them that their characters would reasonably think of as hangouts and information sources. The North Side Speakeasy, the Sycamore, where Miskatonic University is, where the newspaper offices are, etc., etc. Then, as they continue in their investigation and they talk to NPCs, reveal more locations one at a time, where the Temple of Hope is, where the Professor's House is, and finally, where Sticky Jack's apartment is. The players might find out about what was stolen from the newspapers or from going to Miskatonic University itself. To keep things moving and to keep the investigation from dead ending, you can do things like letting your players find a copy of one of the newspapers in the university museum offices, for example, or let them find a copy of even the professor's notes in Jacob Smith's office in the Temple of Hope if they, deci if they decide to break in. Empower the players to come up with creative ways to look for clues and reward them liberally with information when you like their ideas. One final note for this section, an important part of Lovecraftian horror is creating dread, where the characters know they're wrapped up in something that's more sinister than it appears, but they don't know exactly what it is yet. This leaves some doubt about whether it's just dangerous people or a horrifying encounter with the Cthulhu mythos, so that when that encounter actually happens, their dread is realized as terror at the fact that the thing that they were worried about is far worse than they ever could have imagined. I strongly suggest using the Temple of Hope to create this creeping dread for your players. Leave it ambiguous whether the Temple of Hope is just an unusual sect of Christianity or a sinister cult. Let players pick up and read the Strange Power of the Universe book in the Temple. Once they've had their first contact with the Temple, make allusions to cultists following them, like seeing a dark figure dart around a corner, or seeing someone standing outside while they sleep. This will create the dread needed for the final section to have full impact where the player character's worst fears are realized completely as they're confronted by Azathoth's presence in Sticky Jack's apartment. Once the players have all three clues, the mysterious nature of the stolen dagger and notes, the presence of the sinister cult, and the address of Sticky Jack's apartment, they're ready to confront and understand the horror of what has been unleashed in the apartment building. One note before running this section, if you're using the Arkham map that's provided in the screen pack or the PDF, just be aware that Curzon Street isn't actually marked on there. To solve this problem and keep the narrative flowing, I just marked a random dot on the south side and said this is where it is. If immersion in the actual geography of Arkham is important to your group for some reason, I don't know why, but if it is, then maybe what you can do is have them go to Walnut Street, make a few rolls, walk up and down the street for 20 minutes, and then have them find it that way. Once your players have found the location of the apartment, the apartment can be sort of broken down into three encounters. The first is getting into the apartment itself and encountering the crazed housewife Marge. The second is traveling through the non-Euclidean building layout in search of Jack's apartment. And then third and finally is confronting Jack and trying to close the portal. All right, let's start with getting into the apartment building. According to the module, there's only three possible ingresses, a front locked door, a fire escape that's really high and out of reach, and then the back kitchen door to Marge's apartment. I guess what the module expects is that the players will just decide to walk around back and knock on the door, at which point Marge will creepily invite them in for coffee. I really do not like this encounter design. The reason why is because at this point in the game, your players have been role-playing criminals for the better part of two hours. When they see a front locked door, they're going to interpret that as a challenge to try and break in. My players were coming up with all these crazy hijinks, and I basically ended up having to railroad them by telling them that the fire escape was too high and that they should just knock on the back door, which is something I hate doing as a GM. Next time I run this scenario, I may just narrate that the back kitchen door is already slightly ajar, and then at least maybe I could get like a little spook out of them when they walk around back to look through and they see, I don't know, Marge staring back at them. I, I Whatever. If you have a better idea for how to deal with this, feel free to let me know in the comments. March herself is a really fun encounter and a great way to set the tone for the final chapter of the scenario. As a keeper who enjoys trying to jump scare my players, I actually had a really good time doing this. I had Marge give her lines in this really creepy and quiet way, and then when she came back with the coffee pot, I just screeched as loud as I could in character voice and narrated how she threw the coffee pot at one of their faces. My players jumped out of their seats in real life when this happened, and it created an excellent moment of like, we're really in this now. Once your players are in the building and they've dealt with Marge, it's time for them to head upstairs and find Sticky Jack's apartment. Another small gripe I have with this module is that the apartment building is described as this multi-story large building, but the players are given no clues about what floor the apartment is actually on or how to find the door. It's not a huge deal, but I do think it's important to get the players to climb to the second floor after the Marge encounter before they see anything else weird in the building. The reason why is to create a plot device for why the characters can't escape without dealing with Sticky Jack first. The module wants the keeper to play up how this building is like an M.C. Escher painting, where the staircases stretch onto infinity, doors appear in strange places, and you know rooms appear upside down, all that type of stuff. I highly recommend using the staircase as the point of no return for the players. 
Once players walk up the first flight of stairs, you can narrate how the stairs just keep climbing around the corner up into infinity with no end in sight. If they freak out and they try to run back downstairs, narrate the same thing to them, how the landing that they came from isn't there anymore and the staircase just stretches down forever. Once the players have realized that they have no option but to push on, this is where you as a keeper really get to shine in your descriptions of the horrors in the building. This is a good time to refresh what makes a good horror description. For example, don't just say you open the door and there's a ham family hanging by the nooses. Instead, what you can do is describe the smell coming from the room, describe the sound of the flies buzzing and the ropes creaking, describe the color of the dead flesh, the distinctive qualities of each of their faces. Have a blast with this section, but also keep an eye on the clock. By sending your players through an area that they literally can't map, you're taking away some player agency for the sake of narrative, so if you stay here for too long without giving them a way to find Jack's apartment, they might end up getting kind of frustrated. If you want to create even more tension in this section, I highly recommend bringing in the Temple of Hope cultists. They can rush up the stairs after the investigators, and if you're going for more of like a pulpy feel in your game, you could do this really cool Inception-style fight scene with rotating gravity, teleportation through the windows, you name it. So once you're confident that your players have been properly spooked by the horrors of the apartment building, it's time for them to confront Sticky Jack and discover the portal to the court of Azathoth. I ran this section mostly as written. Um, they open the door, they see the ash on the floor, uh, they see the bodies, and then they hear the sounds of both the infernal piping of flute music coming through one of the doors and then screaming of a person from the other. Um, you can have them make a listen roll to figure out which one they want to go through. And I know a lot of people say that you want to really like warn your players multiple times um, that the door on the left is going to drive them completely insane. But for what it's worth, um, I'm going to disagree with that advice. I'm going to say let a player open that door and let them go completely insane. This is a one shot and um, it'll make for a really memorable moment in the game. And it's also really important for actually getting to the conclusion. The other thing that I want to say about this section is that my players, um, when they were confronted with Sticky Jack and he told them, you know, please kill me, please please kill me, they kind of had no idea what to do. And so by driving one of the players insane, I was able to give them sort of an insane insight into how to solve this problem. I sort of described how there was this connection of energy between Sticky Jack's head and the portal, um, and that gave them enough information to understand that they would either need to blow off Sticky Jack's head or alternatively read the paragraph that was on the notes. I also think this works really well because obviously as a player it sucks to lose your character, but the flip side is that if they die in a meaningful way that advances the story, um, it can feel really memorable and actually like a good thing for the player. Just like the horrors in the apartment building, it's up to you as the keeper to decide how the situation resolves. I think at this point in the game, um, I know it sounds scary, but I think you as a keeper will probably have some instincts about how to resolve this in a meaningful way for your players, so I'll leave it up to you to make that decision. So that's Miss Dues. I promise you a one minute actionable plan for how to run this scenario, so let's go over everything from the beginning. There's three main sections to this scenario. The first is them getting the motivation to go find Sticky Jack. The second is them doing the investigation to figure out that he's at 22 Curzon Street and that he stole a bunch of strange artifacts and there's a cult after him. And then the third and final is them going to the actual apartment building itself, confronting the horrors of Azathoth and dealing with closing the portal. In the first section, your primary goal as a keeper is giving them the motivation to continue their pursuit of Sticky Jack, even though it's scary, make the hammer scarier so that they want to keep moving forward. The second section, it really doesn't matter what order the players do things in, just make sure that they get all three of the clues. And then the third and final section, it's up to you to make this scary, um, try to think of some spooks ahead of time, and then when they actually get up to Sticky Jack's apartment, I suggest letting one of them go insane by opening the door to the Court of Azathoth. Um, that's just my take on it. And then from there, it'll be up to you for how to, how to resolve the situation in a way that feels memorable. All right, everybody, I hope this video was helpful. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.